Ghana, the land of bright sunshine and even brighter smiles. It is a country with a diverse natural and cultural heritage. From picturesque beaches strung along the Gulf of Guinea to a hinterland of wide open savannas and tropical forests covering both mountains and plains. From walking safaris alongside elephants and monkeys in the north to poignant forts and castles dotting the coast in the south. And from Queen's villages spread throughout the country to vibrant cities of Accra, Kumasi, Tamale and more. Ghana has something to offer everyone who visits this great African success story. And seeing it from the air gives a totally new perspective on this beautiful and friendly country. A lot of people tend to overlook Ghana when planning their travel in Africa focusing instead on the conventional safari destinations of Kenya, Tanzania, or South Africa. But while Ghana may lack the enormous heads migrating through the Serengeti, it has ample rewards for the increasing number of people choosing to travel here, not to mention the Ghanaians living here. Indeed, Ghana is perhaps a truer representation of Africa as a whole, for Africa is more than just exotic wildlife. Yes, it is a land of incredible natural beauty, savannas teeming with a variety of unique and beautiful wildlife. Tropical coastlines of warm waves crashing on white sand beaches fringed with palms. Waterfalls plunging through dense forests, soaring mountains and fertile plains. But it is also a land of rich culture. Fabrics and furnishings being crafted as they have for centuries. Irresistible music and dancing permeating daily lives. Mouth-watering foods of an endless variety and a burgeoning art scene in every medium. It is a land of history and heritage, some glorious and some that is not. And perhaps most importantly, it is a land of warm and welcoming people, friendly greetings on the streets, generous hospitality regardless of one's circumstance, and long conversations with strangers who fast become friends. And in Ghana, all these factors combine to create a truly memorable, uniquely African experience. Blessed with political stability and security, Ghana has emerged a leader in West Africa. This steadiness has allowed the development of brands and products proudly made in Ghana, like Cowbell, which has been produced in the country for almost 20 years. As Cowbell has become one of Ghana's leading powdered milk products, it has also sought to highlight and develop Ghana as a whole through sponsorships, events, donations, and other CSR initiatives. We believe that part of becoming a successful brand is helping build a successful community. After all, what good does it do if we are a successful brand and those around us do not feel the impact? Cowbell's tagline is our milk emphasis on our. And that's why it's important that for every opportunity that we get, we are able to show this connection to our country and communities. So what better way is there to show this true connection than by taking Cowbell into the sky and around the country to show the world how beautiful really Ghana is. And so Cowbell in the Sky was born. It would be another first for Ghana the first time a hot air balloon has been registered and flown in the country, and a new way to discover the vast beauty scattered around this great nation. For me personally, it's showing from the air in a silent, ecological way, is how beautiful our country is. That's what I want to show. So we will go to the western region, we will go to the eastern region, we will go to the Ashanti BA region, we will go to the northern region, and we will make people aware, mostly Ghanaians, but international people, how beautiful this country is. So we're out on the field in Accra and we're preparing the balloon for the very first inflation. And, uh, and training the team members hands-on on, on a real inflation before we can start flying uh, this week. We're very, very anxious to see how the balloon looks. Hot 
air balloons have been lifting people into the sky for over 225 years. But what exactly is this aircraft and how does it fly? The base principle of the hot air balloon is the law of Archimedes. If you heat air, then the number of atoms in a cubic meter of air declines rapidly. And the weight of that cubic meter is a lot less than the weight of a cubic e uh, meter of standard air, which is outside the balloon. That's why a hot air balloon rises. Huh? Um, and a hot air balloon consists of the envelope, which is constructed of a nylon ripstop fabric. Huh? Um, it has a, we call it a parachute, which we open on landing to let the air go out and the basket is built from wicker because it's still the best uh, material you can use for it. It breaks the shock on landing. Huh? The gas is carried in certified fuel tanks which are connected to a burner, a double burner, which creates the hot air. That's how, in short, a balloon flies. The most unique aspect of ballooning is that the balloon cannot be steered like other aircrafts. It can only go where the wind takes it. But this apparent shortcoming is actually one of the most attractive elements. And it brings you where the wind is bringing you. You cannot direct it. It just pulls you softly over the landscape. Uh, you have amazing views. It's different from when you're in a plane, you know, because when you're in a plane, it feels like, it feels like you're looking at something far away. But I don't know, maybe because this is open air and there's no glass or, you know, any restriction, it felt real and closer. This was free, you know, it was like, it was nice to feel the air blow on your skin and see the grass and everything live. Well, it's an amazing feeling, you know. Uh, we were drifting like a cloud over the plantation. You can see everything, you can take pictures at your, your own time and it's beautiful. It's uh, something I've just never done. This is the first time I was in an air balloon and uh, this is something I will really do again. This is beautiful. It's the most useless means of transportation. And um, because it's useless, it's, um, it's very useful. It takes you away from the earth, from the planet for an hour and uh, it uh, obliges you to not do anything for an hour because you don't have a destination, you can't go to work with it, you can't make plans with it. The only thing you can do is just disappear for an hour and I think that's very attractive. There's a lot to see as you float with the wind over Ghana and the best place to start is just outside the sprawling, bustling capital of Accra. Though the smallest of Ghana's 10 administrative divisions, the Greater Accra region is home to its capital and largest city, Accra. But the best way to see this constantly changing metropolis is at ground level, on foot amongst its friendly, boisterous inhabitants. So we'll let the winds push us a bit north and east towards the Shy Hills Resource Reserve, where the dense urban setting slowly gives way to Ghana's natural scenic beauty. And I was just telling Dirk earlier today that I'm very impressed by the beauty of the country and I, uh, I can't wait to fly over it. exciting to be here. This will be normally, if everything goes well, the maiden fight of the Kabul balloon. And so I'm really excited. They are just keeping the balloon, so it will stand up any moment from now. I'm going to climb in the basket and we'll have our maiden flight if everything goes well. So I'm really excited uh, to be in the Kabul balloon for the first maiden flight. Thank you. I have to run.
staggering. I was very impressed by the beauty. There's a lot of green in this part of Ghana and uh, as a balloonist it was quite an easy flight. So I was feeling very relaxed and, and enjoying the flight. I took lots of pictures myself. I'm overwhelmed by, by the, the, the experience. I'm so glad I took photos. I've been tweeting and Facebooking and doing live videos the whole time because I thought this, this is an experience worth sharing. You have to share this. You don't just talk about it with your friends and family. You share with the world. While this area might not have the soaring hills of the Volta region or the sweeping savannas of the north, it is where most visitors begin their exploration and offers a lot to those willing to spend an extra day or two. Of course, spending an extra day means finding some accommodation. And any discussion of accommodation in this area has to start with the Royal Sinchi. Situated on the banks of the River Volta, a few kilometers downstream from the Akosumbu Dam, the Royal Sinchi proves itself worthy of its name. With 84 sumptuous rooms, all with views over the river, expertly manicured grounds containing five-star facilities for sports and relaxation, exquisite food, and a welcoming, highly trained staff ready to assist in whatever you might need. The Royal Sinchi has won numerous international awards for its consistently high standard of service and amenities, and is recognized as one of the top hotels not just in Ghana, but West Africa as a whole. The Royal Sinchi is not your only option though. For the ultimate in serenity, let the wind push you a little down the road to the peaceful environs of Stone Lodge. Over the last 20 years, Stone Lodge has grown from a family farm and guest house to an extensive campus of 41 rooms, cottages and villas. Only an hour's drive from Accra, it is the perfect escape from the hustle and noise of the city. Stone Lodge offers a countryside appeal to people who have, have barely left the city. You know, it offers serenity, it offers, offers calmness, it offers there's just an environment where you can um, run wild with your imagination. As we float to the east with the breeze, we come back to the Volta as it snakes through the countryside to the relaxed beauty of Adan, where it finally reaches the Atlantic Ocean. And as the wind turns and sweeps us along the coast past the bustling port of Tema and then Accra, we see more resorts scattered along the scenic sandy beaches. But also scattered among the palm trees and waves are some ruins, relics of a darker period in Ghana's history. You cannot tell the history of Ghana without talking about the castles and forts, because they bring back to mind where we started as a people, where we are now, maybe the future. Cape Coast and Elmina castles are perhaps the most recognizable of the 32 castles and forts that dot the coastline of Ghana. Edifices marking the once flourishing gold trade between Europeans and Africans, before that trade was corrupted to include human beings as slaves. Collectively, these fortresses are recognized by UNESCO as World Heritage Monuments for their contribution not only to Ghana's history, but to the world's as well. They are one of the starting points for the African diaspora and a poignant and emotive emblem of one of the darkest chapters in human history. The first fort to be constructed was St. George's or the Elmina Castle, built by the Portuguese over 500 years ago in 1482. It is the oldest European structure in sub-Saharan Africa. The Portuguese used it as their main trading center but after the Dutch captured it in 1637, they turned the storerooms into dungeons and the church into a slave market. For the next 200 years, they crammed hundreds of Africans at the time into dark, fetid chambers, holding them in appalling conditions before sending them through the door of no return on the way to plantations in the New World. At its peak, more than 10,000 captives passed through Elmina each year. Well, we are uh, at one of the most symbolic uh, places at the south coast of uh, Ghana, at Elmina Castle. We have a fantastic place for takeoff next to the castle, very symbolic. So uh, this is uh, probably the flight I've been looking forward to uh, most. I want to see how the, the destination looks like. I mean, in the air, 
not on the aeroplane. I just want to see how Elmina, Cape Coast, the surroundings is going to look like. Just 13 kilometers away is another imposing fortress, Cape Coast Castle, built in 1653 by the Swedish. It was highly sought after by the colonial powers competing in the area and changed hands five times before being captured by the British in 1664. Over the next 150 years, like the Dutch at Elmina, the British oversaw the forced imprisonment of tens of thousands of Africans in its dungeons while they waited to be shipped against their will to the Americas. Many African Americans have traced their ancestry back to this castle. In 1998, two slaves who had died, one a Jamaica lady by the name Krista, and one from New York by the name Samuel Carson. In collaboration with their relatives, their bodies were exhumed and brought back to Ghana. Then to a town around this area called Abanze for a special ceremony. Then after the ceremony, the remains were put into a boat through a door of no return. Uh, sorry, the door of return now, we call it. 500 years ago, they were compared, they were forced through a door of no return. So symbolically, the two had come back to open a door of return for all others who are still there. And more especially, the descendants of the slaves who hitherto thought they could not find their way back. You have Ghana, our beautiful country, and one of the symbols, uh, one of the highest symbols, is this very place, Cape Coast Castle, with an unfortunate uh, history of slave trade. But we are here with the Kabul balloon to show that this is past. This is the past. We are looking at the future. We are freeing ourselves symbolically. We are taking off and we're leaving this history behind. We'll never forget it. We'll never forget it, but it's a turn page. Ghana's coast has much more to offer than just remnants of a dark past. In the shadows of the castles themselves are beautiful palm-lined beaches fronted by the warm waters of the Gulf of Guinea. And as you travel west towards Cape Three Point and Axim, the beaches become even more sublime. One of the most exquisite options is the beach at Lou Moon Lodge in Axim. Perched on the rocky peninsula that borders a small natural beach cove, Lou Moon has a variety of spacious rooms, suits and villas, all with amazing views and premium furnishings. Private villas on the Cape even have their own infinity pools overlooking the crashing surf below. Embracing the spectacular setting, the lodge has been carefully designed in harmony with its surroundings and it's built out of all local materials. The shallow lagoon-like bay is an ideal natural swimming pool with no waves or currents to worry about. And the restaurants boast a daily menu of dishes combining international cuisine with traditional Ghanaian spices, locally caught fish, and garden-grown herbs served in an atmosphere to match. For sure to come to Le Moon, yeah, we, 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 we are offering some uh, a quality of service uh, in one of the most beautiful spots on, on the Ghanaian coast. And we, we, we have one of the uh, only natural swimming pool where you can really swim uh, safely. The coastal breeze is picking up and begins to push us north. As we move away from the coast over the charming town of Axim, we travel into the forest and fertile grounds of the central and eastern regions, where much of Ghana's agriculture is concentrated, including the commercially important crop of palm oil. One of the largest palm oil plantations is located in Kwai, under the supervision of the Ghana Oil Palm Development Company. We currently have about 10,000 hectares of oil palm planted here and about 1,000 hectares of rubber. And we employ about 4,000 people on a permanent basis. And we have an agrower scheme 
So we're also supplying uh, high quality seedlings to the farmers here and about 7,000 of them have joined that scheme. So in total, our project reaches about 35,000 farmers in the area. GOPDC is committed to growing palm oil in an environmentally sustainable way, employing good agricultural practices such as zero burning and using cover crops, as well as developing innovations like drip irrigation system to save upwards of 80% of water and generating electricity by burning recycled byproducts. Today, I'm very proud to announce that we are making biogas here in Ghana, and that biogas is captured and we are sending it to our turbine to make electricity and steam for our refinery project. This is the first one in West Africa that doesn't exist anywhere else, and this is in Ghana. So it looks like a balloon, and today we were in the balloon, so I'm very proud to see that with Cowbell we could do a double balloon project <laughs> today. Continuing north from Kwai, the winds take a left turn at Nkoko, home of the annual paragliding festival, and begin to head west to the cultural heartbeat of the country, the Ashanti region, and the second city of Ghana, Kumasi. Kumasi is home of the largest open-air market in West Africa, several museums and palaces, including the Menshia Palace Museum, as well as the prestigious Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, or KNUSD for short. There is a lot more to see and do in Kumasi, but unfortunately, the winds have continued pushing us north. As we cross the Brongahafo region into the northern region, the lands begin to dry out and the forests steadily turn to savanna. And in the distance, we see a great expanse of unspoiled land, Moli National Park. Designated a national park in 1971, Mole is Ghana's first and largest national park, covering almost 5,000 square kilometers. The park is predominantly open savanna woodland and hosts a wide variety of flora and fauna. There are over 300 species of birds, as well as 93 different types of mammals, including four types of primates, numerous antelope species, predators such as leopards and hyenas, and its most famous residents, elephants. The elephants in Mole are fairly accustomed to humans, thereby allowing visitors a closer look on foot than is possible throughout most of Africa. Activities in the park include walking safaris, game drives, bird watching tours, and canoe safaris, all expertly guided by park rangers and wardens, who will ensure you see as much wildlife as possible. There are plenty of other attractions nearby, including one of the oldest mosques in West Africa, constructed in 1421 in the town of Larabanga, as well as the ecotourism village of Mognori, where you can learn about share water production, traditional medicines, and other cultural practices. The accommodation options around the park received a significant upgrade in 2015 with the opening of Zaina Lodge, West Africa's first luxury safari lodge. Situated on the concession inside the park, about five kilometers from the park headquarters, Zaina stylishly blends the classic safari aesthetic with the comforts and conveniences of modern amenities all while minimizing its environmental impact through the use of local building materials and sustainable ecological business practices, such as the LED lighting and solar-powered water system. Each of the 25 rooms is a beautifully appointed, individually decorated chalet, with a private balcony overlooking the two water holes below, where you are guaranteed to see diverse amounts of wildlife gather. Or if you prefer, Watch the animals while you relax in the infinity pool. Or sip a sundowner cocktail at the outdoor bar. It's hard to leave such a beautiful, tranquil place, but the winds are picking up again, this time blowing us to the east in the city of Tamale. The regional capital of the large northern region, Tamale, is reportedly the fastest growing city in West Africa. Its name comes from the Tama, or the shea butter tree, and you can find this and many other traditional, locally produced goods throughout the area, exemplifying Tamale's unique blend of old and new. Modern office blocks side by side with classic thatched round hats 
all surrounded by pristine Guinea savannah. with all that we've seen so far, there is still so much more to see in Ghana. There is the Volta region with its mountains and waterfalls, not to mention the largest man-made lake in the world. The Upper East region with a sacred crocodile pond at Paga. Upper West featuring the Weichiao Hippo Sanctuary. And many more things in the regions we've already seen. I think uh, one of the most attractive elements about the country at the moment is that there isn't a lot of tourism uh, everywhere. Where you arrive, beautiful places where there's lots of things to see. It's quiet, it's relaxing. You don't have to queue in lines to enter a park, to visit things, to see things. Uh, I like it a lot. I think there's a lot to see and a lot to do for, for tourists. Ghana is the first country you should come to if you want to explore West Africa. This is the most beautiful country that I know, the whole of West Africa. And this is uh, certainly the place you should come, backpackers uh, and even more adventurous tourists. This is a beautiful place to come. We saw wonderful things that you will never be able to see when you're on the ground. With the Kabul balloon, we'll discover more of this uh, beautiful country. I have never thought that we can have hot air balloon in Ghana. So I was like, really? Is that possible? That like, wow. And to see it here, it's, uh, I, I was, let's say, almost crying to see it just because it's a unusual event and it's so, so, so beautiful it's something that you you cannot really expect you know just to have this and that's that's beautiful yeah so there's a line in the song i want to fly around the world in a beautiful balloon it sounded like just another line in the song until today i want to fly around the world in that balloon it was awesome if i wouldn't have been a balloonist i you know, there would only have been a slight chance that I would ever have traveled here. And uh, now we're here, we've flown here, we've landed in villages, we've had the most incredible times. And I already feel a bit Ghanaian today, after these weeks here. So I'm very anxious to bring them here and to show them around myself as a guide. So what are you waiting for? Come see and experience all that our beautiful country has to offer. And while you're here, why not enjoy a delicious glass of cowbell milk? Mm -hmm.